I believe we're living in the last days. I really, really do. And well, maybe that's quite a privilege, you know, to live in the last days. And now when I say the last days of the church age, the church age, um, Jesus here in John chapter 16, when you get down to verse 33, the last verse of the chapter, he tells his disciples, man, he's been talking some pretty rough stuff. He talks about all the, that the world's going to hate him. They're going to be persecuted. He said, I'm leaving. I'm going to send the comforter. And uh, he just, you know, uh, uh, all this stuff going on. And uh, they were troubled about it. And it's understandable. Uh, there's some things they didn't understand. And, and uh, the one they'd put their faith and trust in and so forth. But I want you to look at verse number 33. And he actually has a lot to say about the world, you know, about in this world. And so forth. He said, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. I'll tell you tonight, if we're going to have peace, we're not going to find it in a pill. And we're not going to find it in a pleasure. We're going to find it in Christ. Lasting, genuine, real peace. And in the world, he said, you shall have tribulation. Well, that's a nice last thing to tell somebody, isn't it? In this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to. And by the word tribulation, we're not talking about the great tribulation over in, after the Lord comes for the church. We're talking about just day by day troubles and troubles that this world will give and things that will happen as a result of their hatred toward Christ. But then he says this, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. It's a finished deal. And we can be cheerful because we know the end of the story, right? Now, that, with that in context tonight, he told his disciples that. And he did die and he was buried and he rose from the dead. And then 40 days he was there. And then he went back to heaven. He ascended back to heaven. And he did send the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Okay. And the church age started. The day of Pentecost comes. Then there isn't very many chapters in the book of Acts until there's a man by the name of Saul who was persecuting the church, who was doing what Jesus said they would do. He said, you know, there'll come a time when they that kill you think they're doing God a service. You're going to be hated. You're going to be persecuted. And God saves Saul and turns him into Paul. And the apostle Paul then begins to really minister and, and plant churches and spread the gospel around the world. And Paul is the one who God used to write almost all of the epistles to the church. And Paul and all, every writer in the New Testament epistles to the church picks up from what Jesus told his disciples. And they pick up from that. When you get to the second book of Thessalonians, first and second Thessalonians is particularly about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's two phases. Number one, coming for the church. And number two, coming in power and glory at the end of the tribulation. And first, first Thessalonians has more to do with the coming for the church, the rapture of the church. Second Thessalonians has more to do with the coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation, establishing his kingdom and judging the nations of the world. Now, in uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says something to the church. He says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... And by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Doesn't that sound familiar to what Jesus was telling his disciples back in John chapter 14, 15, and 16? He's saying, listen, don't be shaken in mind, don't be troubled. Neither by, now watch what, there's three things here that they was troubled and they were shaking them up. Spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there shall come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he is as God setteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you I told you these things. Paul said I told you in 1 Thessalonians about these things. He said, I want you to remember that. There's no point in you being shaken in mind. There's no point in you being troubled. There's no point in you being deceived. There's no point in you letting people fool you. I've already told you. And there's another thing that Paul's doing. Paul knows that these people have a copy of the Old Testament. And that the day of Christ, which is the day of the Lord. Those two terms are exactly the same because Christ is our Lord. Jesus Christ, the Lord. And we need probably right here to define what is the day of the Lord. Now, someone may disagree with this, but I'm sorry. It's the truth. 
The day of the Lord is the thousand year millennial reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said a thousand years is one day and a day is a thousand years. And the day of the Lord is when Christ comes back in power and glory. His feet touch the Mount of Olives at the end of the tribulation period. He destroys the armies of Satan, this world, and he establishes his rule and authority. And he rules and reigns on this earth a thousand years. That is called the day of the Lord. It is mentioned 20 times in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord. Christ is the Lord. By the way, that Lord in the Old Testament is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And it talks, it means Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty. And it's proving to you that in the New Testament that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Okay. Now it's the day of the Lord. Now, he said in verse six, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. He's talking about this man of sin, this son of perdition. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked capital W that's referring to, that's a personification, be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's that second coming of Jesus Christ, not the rapture of the church. It's the second coming of Christ. Verse number nine, even him talking about this man of sin whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Please hold those two passages of scripture while we pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, that you've written in it that we don't need to be shaken in mind nor troubled, Heavenly Father, by spirit or by word or by letter of deception. I pray, God, tonight that you help us to build up folks in the faith, to strengthen them, to give clarity, Heavenly Father, and and encouragement that, Lord, you are sovereign, that you know history in advance, that nothing has surprised you, nothing has occurred to you, that you're not going to be taken by surprise about anything, and that all we need is your word to read it and believe it, to rightly divide it, to have assurance and faith in these troubled times. We thank you, Lord, that we can be of good cheer because you have overcome the world. Help us to understand, Lord, the world is not our friend. It's never been the friend of grace, never will be. And God, that you have overcome this world and its systems, its rebellion, its disobedience, its sinfulness, Lord, and you have conquered it. And so, Lord, help us to know that in you, we can have peace and help us to live that out in the day in which we live. In Jesus' name we pray and for his glory alone. Amen. And amen. Paul in the second Thessalonians, I actually going to be preaching more out of second Thessalonians than anything. He again told the church, he said, you've been troubled. You've been shaken in mind. Now listen, when you're shaken in mind, that's not funny business. When something has happened, something has occurred, something's come down the pike that shakes your mind up and you're troubled. It's bothersome. And Paul didn't want the church like that. And God doesn't want you and I like this. He said, you're troubled by something. And he said, there's three things that troubled them. Now, I want you to get a hold of this tonight. You and I are living in the last days. I believe that with all my heart. Now, I don't know how long to be till the Lord comes back. Not try, I don't set dates. I don't do anything of that nature. But there's certainly evidence that from prophecy that we are living. And here's the big thing with me. There's two or three things. Number one, Israel's back in the land. Israel's the time clock. But we're also seeing the great falling away, which I mean by that, the apostasy. And by the way, in that passage of scripture, look at verse number three, 2 Thessalonians chapter two and verse three. They're coming to falling away first. I believe we are seeing that in our very eyes right now. <coughs> we are seeing a falling away, at least in our country, a falling away from the faith that, I, that was given to this nation. Amen. The churches are falling away. They're falling away from the Bible. They're falling away from the fundamentals of the faith. They're falling away into ecumenicalism. And we are seeing literally before our very eyes in my time, since I've been preaching 30 years now, plus, I have seen, watch this, and it has accelerated in this last 10 years. I mean, it has accelerated the falling away. Now, I'm not up here tonight trying to go, woo, 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 woo. That's not my, pro- uh, my, my purpose is to give you and I peace, <coughs> confidence, courage, and assurance so that we're not shaking in mind or troubled. No matter what happens. Now, I won't tell you why we need that. I have grandchildren. I've got 11 grandchildren right now. And if I don't keep my eye on this book and I watch what's going on out here in this world, I could get shook up. I really could. And I'm telling you, I've got to stay in this book. Now, he said, first of all, they get shook by spirit. And you notice it didn't say capital S. It said a spirit shook them up. 
This was in the church. This was in the church. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. There is a spirit that's not the Holy Spirit. And I, I deal with people. I mean, I'm out here a lot. I meet people and I talk to people about the Lord, talk to people about church and so forth, have all this stuff. And you'd be amazed how many people will tell you stuff like, well, last Sunday, uh, uh, we had a word of prophecy in our church. Did you see the second thing there? The first thing that comes into a set of believers is a spirit that's not the Holy Spirit. And the second thing will be a false word or an additional word beyond the Bible. Had a man told me recently, he said, I was at church Sunday night and a man jumped up and said he had a word of prophecy for me. And I said, I, I didn't know God wasn't done right in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> now they don't go along. They don't see it like that. They think that people's got, but I want to tell you something. Here's what I told him. I said, let me tell you something. If you claim that uh, you died and went to hell and come back, what am I supposed to believe about the next guy's story? I thought the Bible said it's appointed unto men wants to die and after this, the judgment. And if a spirit comes in and that spirit is just kind of telling people this and that, what had happened in this church was this, there was a spirit came in and told these people that they had missed the day of the Lord. And it shook them up because Paul had just wrote him a letter over there. So now what, and here's what I'm saying to you. You got a spirit that'll come in and then you got a word. Somebody comes up and says, God told me. Well, I want to tell you something. If God tells anybody anything that's contrary to the word of God that was already written in 1 Thessalonians, it's wrong. And Paul's trying to say, hey, why don't you just wake up and get back to the word of God and quit listening to this spirit that's giving you a word. And if you watch your, I don't do this, but I can just tell it from everybody you hear them talking. You watch these re religious TV shows and Joyce Meyer and all her bunch. And it's all got, they got a word from God. We got a word from God. We got a word from God. And you know what? And all that's about is trying to act super spiritual and make people think you're really in touch with God and they're not. So I, God gave me a word of prophecy about you. You're so, you're so dumb spiritually. You're so out of whack. God can't talk to you personally. And you couldn't talk to God like I can. The old song says, what more can he say than to you he has said? Right. Amen. We don't need, and Paul's, Paul's telling flat out, he said, you've had a spirit come in that church and you've had a word come in that church through that spirit that's not of God. And it's contrary to what I've already told you. I, I told you it's not going to come till they're coming falling away first. And he said another thing. He said, by letter, by letter from us. You know what had happened? Somebody had, impo had impersonated Paul, wrote a letter to the church claiming it was Paul. Look what it says. He says, not by letter as from us. They wrote a letter contradicting what Paul had already said. A letter. Not only was there a spirit, not only was there this quote word, but then there was a letter to try to back it all up. Now you say, Reggie, does that still happen? The Book of Mormon. There's all kinds of stuff being written. And by the way, if you, I would say to you that most Christians are reading far more letters, books, than they're reading the Bible. People love to read books about religion and books about the Bible rather than read the Bible. Paul said, this is dangerous. It's getting you into trouble. It's no wonder you're all shook up. It's no wonder you're all messed up and believing all. Okay, you don't know what to believe now. And so that's the thing he's getting into it. Now, let me just say this thing about the day of Christ. I want you to take your Bible. Now, let's look at here at uh, verse number two in 2 Thessalonians. He said, as that the day of Christ is at hand. All right, that means right now. Okay, now. Go to Isaiah chapter 2, and I'm going to give you an Old Testament example of the day of Christ. One of the passages of Scripture that tell you about the day of Christ. And what Paul was saying, listen, you've got the Bible. It's not a new thing in the New Testament about the day of Christ. The Jewish people, Israel, looked for the day of Christ. They looked for the day of the Messiah, the day of the Lord, when he would rule and reign. And that's what they were looking for. It's the, called the kingdom. It's called the kingdom. And by the way, it's called the gospel of the kingdom. That's what John the Baptist preached. It's what some of the disciples preached. And it's what will be preached during the tribulation period, by the way. Isaiah chapter 2, everybody there say amen. amen. All right. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. Now that word mountain in the Bible, if you study the book of Daniel... Teach you, mountain talks about rulership, reigning, power, authority, and the kingdom. All right? If you connect that with the, with the book of Daniel. And he said, and all nations shall flow into it. What's he talking here about? He's talking about the day of the Lord, the, the kingdom reign of Jesus Christ. 
And many people shall go and, and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For our Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among many nations, that's Matthew chapter 25, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, let me give you an example how this has happened in our day. Exactly what happened in 2 Thessalonians. How many knows where that verse is inscribed on a building? It's inscribed on the United Nations building, and it's a misapplication of that passage of Scripture. The United Nations is not bringing in the kingdom. Jesus Christ is. The United Nations has not brought peace on this earth and goodwill toward men. Jesus Christ will. But what did they do? They took that verse, applied it to themselves instead of to the day of the Lord. That's why I know that the United Nations organization is an abomination and a satanic antichrist spirit flowing out from it because it is trying to rob Jesus Christ of his reign and kingdom. It took it out, took this, it's just like the devil to take a passage of scripture and misapply it away from Jesus Christ. Now, he said, verse five. O house of Jacob, come ye and will us walk in the light of the Lord. This is kingdom passages. Isaiah's full of it. The prophets are full of it. Verse 6, therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves the children of strangers. Their land is also full of silver and gold, neither is any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is any end of their chariots. Their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands. Now he's talking about, the first five verses were the prophecy concerning the coming kingdom. In verse number six, he's talking about the condition that they're in now. And he said, verse number nine, the mean man boweth down, the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive thee not. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord, for the glory of his majesty. He's talking about the condition of this world when the Lord comes. He said, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in what? That day. For the what? There it is. The day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And it goes on down through there. Verse 17 says, The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go in the holes of the rocks and in the caves of the earth. Does anybody know where that is in the New Testament? That's in the book of Revelation. During the tribulation period, prior to, to, to the Lord's coming back. And it, look, it says, for fear of the Lord, for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. And uh, verse 21 talks about he's going to shake terribly the earth. And so here's a prophetic deal in Isaiah about the day of the Lord. Now, let me give you something here. Take your Bible to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. We're, I'm preaching on prophecy tonight. And the reason I'm doing this is because prophecy can comfort you. Prophecy can encourage you. A prophecy can, I mean, it can, it can, it can bless your heart. And I think you and I are needing a little bit right now. Cause you know what? I told my daddy this morning, I said, daddy, I hate to see it, but I think America's going to go down. Now I pray for revival and I don't know how long it'll take for it to go down, but no nation can do what this nation is doing and continue. God has historically destroyed them and it may take a hundred years, but God will do it. He'll bring us down. He'll, I'll tell you what I see right now. It's already coming down. Our nation is divided. We're not united. Our nation is, is broke beyond financially, beyond repair. Our nation is bankrupt morally and spiritually. Truth has fallen in the street. We've embraced perversion. God has no choice. If he's holy and consistent, he has no choice but to judge this nation. And I think it's already being judged. I really do. But I think things are being staged for the uh, coming of the Lord. Now, Revelation chapter 7, you hold on to that second Thessalonians chapter 2 because we're going to stay there. Let me tell you what I believe the Bible teaches. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible said there's going to come a great falling away before the day of the Lord. Okay. I believe the Bible teaches that in the church age, in fact, if you, the seven churches in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, the last one is the church of the Laodiceans, right? What is that church characterized by? I'm rich and need nothing. Lukewarm. Just washed out. Nothing. Just a shell. Thou say, you know, just, just a shell of religion. So what does that tell you? If that's the last church in the church age, the condition of it, that pictures the great falling away. That's why I don't believe, 
And don't, I may be wrong, okay? I don't believe there's going to be any great revival. I hope there's a lot of people saved, but I, I think the church age with the Gentile powers is going to end in apostasy, which is the great falling away. I believe the kingdom is going to be preceded in the tribulation by a great revival, and I'm going to show you why. And that revival is going to be precipitated through Jewish believers headed into the kingdom. Look at Revelation chapter 7. And the fifth, uh, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 7. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds. Now, by the way, this is after chapter 6, which is a index or a index of the whole tribulation. Okay. Standing on the corner, four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor, nor on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east. And that's an important phrase because the, the Jews believe that the Messiah is coming from the east. That tells us that these people have their eye on the east. There's, there's some people looking for the Messiah, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, the next few verses you're going to see listed, 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 of each one, 144,000. I hate to disappoint the Jehovah Witnesses, but it's not them. It's not them. In, during the tribulation period, there's going to be 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe that God is going to save and call into the ministry. And you, there's more to read about them. And they're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Okay. And um, look at verse number nine. I'm just going to jump through all those tribes. And by there's an interesting thing. There's two tribes that have been substituted. Dan and Ephraim are not in that tribe and that list of tribes have been substituted by Levi. And I forget another one. Anyway, I won't get into that. That's a whole nother subject. But look at verse number nine. After this, I beheld and Lord great after what? After he had sealed these 144,000 Jewish evangelists. I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders and round the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might that seven things be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered and said unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now listen to me. Somebody says, Ain't nobody going to be saved during tribulation. Not true. But there's one thing you need to separate. In the Old Testament, the church was not here. Old Testament saints are Old Testament saints. Church, New Testament saints are New Testament church saints, okay? The church is not Israel, and the church is a unique mystery, Paul called it, okay? Composed of Jew, Gentiles primarily, but there are some Jews that are saved, part of the church. The church has been taken out. These are tribulation saints, okay, that are saved in the tribulation through the preaching of these Jewish evangelists, all right? I'm going to tell you something. There's been quite a revival went on in Revelation chapter 7. The church age is going to end in apostasy. And the kingdom is going to start with a humongous revival. And all these people saved out of all these tribes and nations flowing into Jerusalem when Jesus Christ rules and reigns there. Now, <laughs> having said that, I want to just get on this thing about us, what's happening for us. Matthew chapter 24 talks about Noah, that Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming son of man. Luke chapter 17 says, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming son of man. Noah's day was described by per, per, uh, permissiveness. Anything goes. It's, you know, nobody rules us. But Lot's day was known for perversion. Jesus said, watch this, that both these attitudes and spirits would be present at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And we have it. We have a spirit of permissiveness and a spirit of perversion. Anything goes and perversion, permissiveness and perversion. Nobody's supposed to pre- prevent me from doing anything I want to do. If I want to go in a girl's bathroom, it's my business, not yours, see? Anything I want to do, nobody tells me right, wrong. An age of permissiveness, which in, in lots day, and boy, it's just amazing to me, the accuracy of the Bible. Now, in 2 Thessalonians there, in your verses 1 through 6 there, there's some things. First of all, he says, uh, verse number um, 3 let no man deceive you by any means for that day, this day of Christ that they had been, you know, looking for, shall not come except they're coming, falling away first. I believe we're seeing that. Then what's going to come is the man of sin be revealed. Now, it's a funny thing. The book of Revelation, Revelation means revealed. It's an interesting thing that the Antichrist, the man of sin, is going to be revealed. In fact, the word revealed is mentioned several times down through that passage of Scripture. And it calls him the man of sin and the son of perdition. There is a say that God is a triune Godhead, God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy ghost. Satan has a Trinity, the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. And this man of sin, the false prophet is a, the devil, he was counteractive to God, the father, the beast is counteractive to God, the son, the false prophet is counteractive to God, the Holy ghost. And this man of sin is the Antichrist, all right? And it says he'll do something. He'll oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. Now, there's an interesting phrase there. Look at this. Who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God. There's a phrase. All that is called God. Think about that. Think about that. What all, calls, what, what all groups and stuff calls God, calls something God? Is not the Muslims Allah called God? You see, you go around the world. Let me tell you what's happening right here. It's showing you very clearly the ecumenical movement that's going to happen and the combined of religions that's going to come together at the end times. This man of sin is going to bring all these various religions together because this world is headed into super chaos. Let me tell you a little bit of something tonight. If America goes down in its united power and we have a, you know, a populistic deal that tears up. Can you, I'm telling you, what, we are a restraining power to a lot of really rough stuff in the world. And what's happening right now is there are nations testing us to see if we'll stand or not. And what's going to happen. And the weaker we look, it's, it's kind of like this. The wolves are outside the sheepfold. And if they see the shepherds leaving, they're more brazen to enter in. I read the other day where a pack of wolves out in, in uh, Colorado or Idaho somewhere killed 19 elk in one night and I mean, in one pasture and, it, and and here's what i'm saying to you wolves and that kind of stuff don't come around if they think there's danger to them these nations are getting ready to prey on and predatorize on and this is why i believe that america plays a big part in this thing because if we go down and we're not a force in this world for good you're going to see guys like Hitler raise up real fast. I mean, I'm telling you, you can just see it already. They're predatorizing. I mean, there's going to be awfulest, chaotic mess you've ever seen in your life. And um, so anyway, he's called the man of sin. He's called the son of perdition. By the way, Judas, uh, Judas is the only one I know in the Bible, uh, other called that. But he's revealed. Now, I want you to go to Exodus chapter 28. Ex- I'm at Exodus. Ezekiel. Boy, oh boy. Ezekiel chapter 28. And I'm going to show you something over here. I want to make a brazen statement tonight that there is not a New Testament truth but what is already given in the Old Testament. Either by type or by just literal in letter. Now, watch what's this thing when it talks about this uh, t- sitting, that this Antichrist, this man of sin will sit in the temple of God. Ezekiel chapter 28. The word of the Lord came again unto me saying, son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. And I'm going to submit to you that that is talking about the man of, it's a picture of the, of the Antichrist. Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up and thou hast said, I am a God. Whoa. First Thessalonians, second Thessalonians chapter two. I sit in the what? Seat of God. Remember what it said in second Thessalonians chapter two, that he sitteth. In the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's not the first time that was told you in the Bible. It's in Ezekiel chapter 28. 
and in the midst of the seas, which is a type of nations, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Now here's a wild thing. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that they can hide from thee. Now, who's he talking about here? Well, how many knows that Ezekiel 28 is one of the most vivid descriptions of Satan in the Bible in the last part of that chapter? Look at verse number 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyrus. It's going to tell you who he really is now. And say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum of full of wisdom, perfect and beauty. Thou hast been in where? Eden, the garden of God. Who was in Eden? The devil, the serpent. Every precious stone was thy covering. The Sardis, Topaz, goes all down, gives you a description of him. And it tells you in the latter part of that verse that pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Now there's some good stuff there. It's going to tell you the area that Satan is strongest in. And he's strongest in music. And can I tell you something? What took America down? I believe with all my heart that rock music and ungodly music took America down. Because music is a medium, it's a worship, it's a system of worship. And you, I'll tell you what, just the other day, isn't it amazing that, uh, that the Bible calls Satan the prince? Who was it passed away this week or last week? Isn't that interesting? He had a name called Prince. And you would have thought the whole world worshipped that guy. I don't even know what, I mean, I don't even know nothing about him, but you'd have thought the whole world's worshipped him. But what was he involved in? Music. Music. Gabriel is a messenger archangel. Michael is a military archangel. And Satan was a music archangel. And I submit to you there's more power in music than there is in military. Let me prove that to you. America could not be taken down militarily, but we were taken down by music. Music did what bombs couldn't do to this nation. This is who we're dealing with in 2 Thessalonians. He's, been, he's talked about here in Ezekiel chapter 28. In verse 14, he says, thou art the anointed cherub. By the way, he, thou was created. So he's, he, you see, he's not God, but he's as God. Okay. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled thee in the midst of violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore, I cast thee a profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of, the bright, of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And it goes on and on there about him. Now, that is the same person that is discussed in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So we've been looking that the man of sin has been revealed and, and uh, that this day will not come till he's been revealed. Now, the mystery of iniquity is going to be restrained in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 there in verse number 4 through verse number 7. Now, here's the deal. If you read Ezekiel chapter 28 there, and all every time you read about Satan, here was Satan's whole desire to start with. He wanted to usurp the authority of God. What did Satan tell Jesus when he had him in the temptation in the wilderness? Thou will fall down and worship me. Let me tell you what Satan wants from you tonight. He wants your worship. He wants to be God. He wants you to worship him. That's why if he can get you to not serve the Lord, because no, no man can serve two masters, and you don't, you're not neutral. We either serve God or we serve the devil. And so Satan's whole historic desire down through the centuries has been to dethrone God, to enthrone himself, and to have the worship. He wanted to set, Isaiah talks about it, he wanted to sit uh, in the throne of God and he wanted the worship that God is deserved of. Now, all false religions have Satan behind them. All of them. Anything, I'm telling you, they're all designed to bring worship to Satan in the end. He said, all that is called God. Hmm. That tells you. This man of sin will reunite. Well, he's going to unite all the false religions of the world. Believe it or not. Now, I'm telling you something. I have some debate. I don't know everything about prophecy. And I ain't never read or heard anybody that does. And I get kind of weary at these guys who say they've got every bit figured out. I do know that there's going to be a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem. And I think that temple must have, must be going to be built either 
toward the soon when the Lord Jesus is coming or right after the rapture of the church, you have to begin the tribulation period, when the Antichrist makes a peace with Israel. I don't know. But the fact of it is, it says that he's going to sit in that temple. So there has to be a temple. All right. I don't know when it's going to be built. I don't know. But I know this. There's an outfit in Jerusalem right now called the Temple Institute that has all of the all the temple furniture already built. They've got a herd of red heifers. They've got everything that's needed for temple worship set to go. And all the temple design, blueprints, everything ready. They're just waiting for the opportunity to build it on the temple mount. I believe the man of sin, this son of perdition, is going to somehow or another bring three things together on this earth. He's going to bring Islam, Judaism, and apostate Christianity together. And when that happens, he's going to, the other religions will just flow in. Okay? He's going to bring them all together under his umbrella. And he's going to do it in such a way. I'm going to tell you something. When you have a president of the United States saying that the Muslims, Allah, is the same God as, our, as Christian gods, you've got a serious problem. You've got a man who is set to be deceived by the Antichrist. What I'm preaching to you tonight is this, is about strong delusion. And I, as a preacher, as a Christian, have an obligation to make myself, to educate myself, to know what's going on, to be aware of the things that's going on in our culture, because I'm going to tell you something. God's people are a called out, separated people unto Jesus Christ alone. And Jesus Christ does not mix with any other religions. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. And it's exclusively through Jesus Christ. The delusion is going to be is that this false Messiah that you can come through these other ways. Now, this new world leader, this Antichrist, he's going to take control of a runaway deal. Now, you listen to me. America is like a runaway train. We're, our nation is kind of like a train going down a bad mountain. And what's happening in the election right now, now I don't let you listen to me. I have people talking to me about, well, Ted Cruz, he seems to be a good, solid Christian. And I agree with you. I think the man's got guts, courage, convictions. I, I, I believe he's solid, okay? I'm not telling you to vote for him. I'm telling not to vote not to vote for him. But what I am going to tell you is this, that people wonder, they think, well, you have people talking about Trump. Let me tell you about conservatism. You watch out for the Republican Party. You watch out for conservatism movement in America. Let me tell you why. It is a movement absent of true Christianity. There's really not a lot of difference between conservatism and progressive liberalism. The only thing is that conservatism has within it, Christians have joined themselves to conservatism as an avenue for political activity. And for the last 30 years, we voted for conservatives thinking that they would represent our views and biblical views. And when they get elected, we say nothing. Now, I'm telling you something right now. People says, how come Trump's getting so many votes? Let me tell you why he's getting so many votes. He is preaching conservatism, his brand, absent of any scriptural, biblical Christian principles. And the reason he is so popular right now is because your average Joe up and down the highways here. They want to embrace conservatism and patriotism, but they don't want anybody that's really serious about serving God in it. It's called libertarianism. They're patriotic, they're constitutional, but leave God out of it. I'm going to make a prediction to you that the Republican Party is going to be taken over by queers within 10 years. I hope not, but I'm afraid of it. And if you really check Trump out, there's not that much difference between him and liberals and progressives. I mean, I'm I'm just going to be honest with you. He typifies to me and I'm not, you're voting for you tonight. Help yourself. Okay. I'm just telling you honest to goodness. Not what I see from scripture is he is a pretty good example of somebody who can talk the line and talk the talk and swing people. And it sounds real good to him. And yet in their heart of hearts, they know this guy has no real genuine interest in Christianity and the word of God. And I get tickled today in talking about he's not politically correct. He's probably the most politically correct candidate that's running. If you really listen to him close. Now, I'm not up here to beat on him tonight. If he gets elected, you know, I pray the best for America. And I'm going to tell you something flat out tonight. I'd rather see him than Hillary. 
Okay, I, I, I've quit preaching. I understand that. I'm just off on Reggie land. <laughs> but what I, am, <laughs> what I am saying tonight is that I see the setup. America's like a runaway train. And Trump's going to grab the engineer's break. And he's going to make America great again. And everybody's all whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you something. America's not going to be great again because he says so. America will only be great again when America returns to God. Yes. And that's it. And ain't no political figure out there. And by the way, Ted Cruz can't make America great again. Let me tell you something. The most godly Christian you know, if he was president, is not going to make a difference unless the people of this country decide they want to get back to God. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot make this country great just by decree. Anyway... What's going on? Now, let's look at this. But I'm getting so wound up. I don't know. Good grief alive. Oh, let's go down this thing. Um, uh, okay, thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dean. I needed that. Verse 7 is where I want to get. Now, I'm going to get back on track. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. He's talking about this, this spirit of Antichrist. Only he who now letteth, he, that's a person. I believe that's referring to the Holy Ghost. Who now letteth, and that word letteth means allowing or not allowing, controlling, until he be taken out of the way. What's that talking about? I believe he's referring to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 17, when it's talking about the rapture of the church. Now, right now in America, what's restraining evil from just taking over? Brother Terry, tell me, what's just keeping pure evil from taking this country over? The Holy Spirit working through believers. The Holy Spirit working through believers. How many see very clearly that, uh, I mean, this country, there is an element in this country that's, you know, that's progressive. They hate Christian people. They hate people that stand up for Christ. They hate, uh, by the way, we're the salt. Whether, I'm telling you tonight. And by the way, we are salt and we are light. And this is something I want to get across to the church. Now, let me, I'm going to talk to the church a little bit. This church is under probably, I've been in the last, the last two or three years under the greatest attack I've ever, I've been here a long time. I have never seen this church under greater attack. Never. Okay. And I mean, Satan is coming with us with everything he's got, folks. Now, you need to get this tonight. If you, if you love the Lord and you care about your church, you need to understand Satan is coming at this church with everything he's got. There's a reason because this church is being salt and light in this community and he doesn't like it. You know what he wants us to do? He wants us to shut our mouths, get back inside the doors on Sunday morning, have our little church service and go back out and live our secular lives. He does not want us reaching the gospel. I got a call for the evening from a guy from Michigan, <laughs> Sister Pitts. He thought you had just quit putting messages on sermonaudio.com. I, I thought, and he says, man, live, there ain't been no message. I, and I said, oh, they've been gone to Alabama and so forth. But he says, man, I listened. He said, wait, Reggie, we ain't got no churches up here to preach the King James Bible. We ain't got to believe the word of God anymore up here. And there's a lot of things going on. I'm just saying this to you. It's not just out in the out of the area, but it's right here in the area. And Satan's going to try to shut this church's mouth. And I want to tell you something. By the grace of Almighty God, either God's going to have to take me out, or we're going to keep doing it and get and get tougher at it. We're going to. I mean, I, I'm not backing up. I'm going to load my gun again. I mean, I'm honest with you. I have no intention of backing. I'm I, the devil. Look, but greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I help thee. Do I get down? Do I get discouraged? Yes! But I can be of good cheer because he's overcome the world. And I want to tell you something tonight. We need to be understanding what kind of times we're living in. And I want to be salt and I want to be light. And uh, I want to be that restraining power. But you listen to me. One of these days, the trumpet of God is going to sound, the dead in Christ is going to rise, and we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with the Lord to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, at that time, the restraining power is out of here, and I'm going to tell you, pure evil is going to march through this land. Pure evil is going to march through this land. And he said, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, verse 7, until he who let us will let it until he be taken out of the way. And what God is going to do is remove the influence of the Holy Spirit on this earth. And he's going to let them have their way. And they want darkness. He's going to let them have it. And then shall that wicked be revealed. That tells me that if, that, if we're accurate on this, that we won't really know who he is until the Holy Spirit has taken the church out. Okay. Now, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of the coming. Just write down in your deal there, uh, Matthew chapter 24. 
Well, you can read about that, how God's going to destroy him with the brightness of his coming. Darkness will literally set in on the earth. The sun will be darkened. The moon will be darkened. The stars will not shine. What's going to happen? Total darkness is going to envelop this earth at the end of the tribulation. And the Bible said as the lightning, the Lord's going to come and he'll, he'll destroy them. The Bible said with the brightness of his coming. All right. Now, so I just want you to know this, that, uh, that God is still in control. You say, Reggie, you know, it's comforting to me. That's why the Holy Spirit is called the comfort in John 16. That God knows the future. I mean, he really does know the future. And I'll tell you something. The thing that blows my mind, if he knows the future, I mean, I just don't understand it all. But he does know it. And he's telling us in advance. And so we don't have to be shaken. We don't have to be troubled. And all that stuff that he's told his disciples in there now. The last thing here, let's look at verses 8 through 12. And then shall that book be revealed. Now, the first thing, there's three things I want you to remember tonight. Number one, Satan is as subtle as ever. Number two, man is as sinful as he ever was. But number three, God is as sovereign as he ever was. And though Satan is subtle and though man is a sinner, God is still sovereign. And he's going to destroy the, the, this Antichrist with, the bright, with, with his power there. He said in verse number with the brightness of his coming. But here's what I want to get you for in this day. In verse number nine, here's something to go. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them something strong delusion. That's where we are at. This nation has rejected light, rejected truth, and God is sending strong delusion on this nation. We are deceived. We think that our military power, that our economic wealth, or that having two oceans on each, each side of us is going to keep us from trouble. It's not going to do it. Safety is of the Lord, the Bible said. Except the Lord keep the house. And here's what I want to tell you tonight. Don't be deceived by all the junk you see going on. Uh, there is, in the Bible, five periods of miracles, and this is what I want to get to. Because did you read what it said there? That he's going to deceive them with power and signs and lying wonders. There are in the Bible five times when miracles occur in the history of mankind. Number one is in the book of Exodus. Moses throwed his rod down, turned into a serpent. The magicians did the same things. How many knows that the magicians turned water into blood like Moses did? Now you're talking about tremendous, by the way, the ten plagues of, of Exodus are a picture of the tribulation. Okay, and the Red Sea is a picture of God delivering Israel through the tribulation. The fiery furnace in the book of Daniel, the three Hebrew children are a picture of Israel being delivered through and Jesus Christ being with them through the tribulation period and them coming out without fire and not destroyed. There's all kinds of pictures of it in the Old Testament. The second time in history was when Elijah and Elisha lived. Elijah would do miracles. And Elisha did twice as many miracles. Elijah did eight miracles. Elisha did 16 miracles. You count them up in the, in the Bible. The third time was when Daniel, there were miracles. God shut the mouths line. But here's what I want to get to you. God would have a period of miracles, signs, okay, and wonders. Then there would be a long period when there weren't miracles. And people just lived by faith. Then here would come a period of miracles and so forth. I want to tell you about miracles. They're kind of dangerous. Kind of dangerous for Reg Kelly. Because you see something, you go, wow. Boy. Now you let me tell you something. That wicked person, that Antichrist, is going to perform signs and line wonders and powers so much that if it were possible, he would deceive even the very elect. And I don't want, if I die and the Lord takes me out, I don't want any of you young people deceived by any signs, powers, and line wonders. The just shall live by faith. You live by this book. And you know, uh, I'll just go through them. Third was Daniel. The fourth time was Jesus Christ when he was here. He performed miracles. But the fifth time in the Bible when miracles are going to be prevalent during the tribulation period. And the devil is going to do miracles. And he's going to deceive people. And they're going to think, wow. This guy's got to be it. And they're going to follow him. And so I want you to be what the Bible says here. 
In verse number 11, for this cause God shall send a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That came because they had a deliberate rejection of biblical truth. And God said, if you don't want to take the light, then I'm going to let you believe a lie. It is very, very dangerous to reject light and to reject truth. Because when you do it, you keep it up. God will turn you over to a lie. And the first thing that happens, you'll know you'll start believing garbage and lies and junk. And Satan will fill you so full of light. God just literally says, he said, he said, because they receive not the love of the truth, they might, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned. I'm telling you something. I want us to be people of truth, people of courage, people of strength, know what's going on, and uh, don't get deceived, don't get fooled by stuff, don't get caught up in a bunch of junk. Amen? Amen. And know what's going to happen. Don't let people tell you a bunch of stuff. I, I, I kind of got a funny feeling that there's going to be people coming on the scene here in, in, within the next few years that's going to come up with a lot of new stuff that came from God. Quote. But it's not going to be the God of the Bible. And I just want you to stay with this whole book. Paul said, I've already told you that the church is going to be taken out before the day of the Lord. You don't need all this stuff. You don't need to believe all this stuff. And don't, I don't care whether it's, listen, here's the main thing I want to get across to you tonight. I don't care whether it's a spirit. And by the way, I had a lady tell me one time, she says, Reggie, she, uh, her and her husband, Karen and I was visiting with him. And she was very, very concerned. She said, we went in this church service and she said, the next thing I know, there's people falling all over the floor and there's this guys walking up to him and hitting him and everything. And she said, I'm telling you something. I felt very, very uneasy. She said, I mean, something, I don't like the spirit that's in this place. And she said, the next thing I know, I was on the floor. And she said, my husband helped me get up. And she said, I'm going to tell you something. Was there a spirit there? Yes. You bet. She said, was it the Holy Spirit? No. And she said, with every being in my heart, she said, but she said, I'm going to tell you something. She said, if I would have just let myself, I would have probably thought, man, this has got to be real. This has got to be of God. These people are sincere. You say, Reggie, why do you say that? Because if you ever get started down that little trail of letting signs and wonders and miracles and all this mystic phenomena controlling your faith life. They don't tell them where you're going to wind up at. Hire a Krishna or somewhere else. Let me throw one more thing at you tonight. And I'm a shepherd. I'm supposed to warn the flock and keep the flock out. You stay away from yoga. Yoga is hell's trash. Am I right or not? Amen. It's hell's trash. It's satanic. And I don't care what they tell you about it. You stay away from it. You see, but I want to meditate. Why don't you meditate in the Bible? Go down to the creek someday. Pull your feet off. Stick your feet in the creek. Take your old Bible with you and get on a stump. Meditate. Read it and meditate. Read it and meditate. I'm going to tell you right now. God told us to meditate a long time before the Hindus and the Buddhists ever dreamed about it. Yes, sister. Oh, there's a place I think we're, at, we're at, uh, I'm trying to think. I think there's a place where the singers are supposed to go up in front of them. Yeah, but was there like God said, I want, this is what I want? I'm not sure on that. I'm not sure on that. I'm really not. I have to look it up again. I, I know there's a past scripture about that, but I'm not sure whether God told them to or whether they just decided that's what they wanted to do. Because we were talking about music and I thought about the power of music. Yeah. Yeah, and the guys wore dresses. <laughs> look, Glenn, you want to, you want, you want, don't, wouldn't mean you look good blowing a bag of pipe wearing a skirt, but I'm telling you what, ugh. Mercy sakes alive. Anyway, you know, hey, 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 I, I, I'm not, you know, it's a, it's a, that, that's the only part in the movie Faith Like Potatoes I didn't like. He comes out with a bag, he comes out with a skirt on, a Scottish deal, you know, but anyway. Um, I, here's my deal tonight. If we truly believe we're living in the last days and there's a great falling away and there's apostasy, really guard yourself against all the stuff that's out here. You know, don't even trust Reg Kelly. 
Here's an interesting thing. Watch this. Paul had to tell the church of Thessalonica, hey, wait, 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 get back in the Bible. Why don't you check it out against scripture? If you'd have read 1 Thessalonians, you wouldn't have been having the trouble that you had in 2 Thessalonians. That's his real message to him. Now watch this. You get over to the book of Acts when it tells about Paul and Thessalonica. He said, watch this scripture. The believers in Berea were more noble than they in Thessalonica in that they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. Wow. He literally tells so in the book of Acts. He said the believers in Berea read their Bible. And the guys at Thessalonica were listening to everybody come down the pike with a new spirit and a new letter and a new word. I just want to encourage you to stay in your Bibles. I don't know all about prophecy. I know the Lord's coming back. I don't know when. But I know it's coming back and I know one thing. If this ain't like the days of knowing like the days of Lot, I'd like to know what it would be. Lord, come quickly. Amen. Y'all tired of hearing all that nonsense? Boy, I'm going to tell you what. Well, now listen, we're going to be done. I'm probably Wednesday night's going to be my last world history Bible class. I'm going to tell you to read the rest of the book yourself. Okay? We're, about, we're getting close to the end, and I'm getting anxious to get on with something else. Okay? So y'all can read the rest of it. We're going to talk about, the, we, actually what we're going to do is just zip through from the Korean War up to, you know, present time. We're going to zip through that because most of you lived in that time. How many knows that in the Korean, after the Korean conflict was over, we left at least 400, maybe 400 American soldiers as prisoners of war and never did bring them home? How'd you like to have a son that got captured over there and the United States government didn't go, didn't go back after him? Said, oh, said, everybody come home. Let's go on being, let's go on living life. I want to submit to you that Douglas MacArthur is one of the greatest generals and greatest patriots men that this nation ever had. And your liberals are making him out to be a criminal in American textbooks. And he took a stand and the stand he took got him fired as Supreme Commander. Well, this is Wednesday night. I'm sorry. Let's go home. Let's stand. Brother Larry Lawson. Please, and folks, let's pray right now tonight that we'd be people of the book and not be deceived by signs and lying wonders and so forth. And we wouldn't pay too much attention to all these spirits running back and forth across the country. And can I tell you something? There wouldn't be a Mormon on the face of this earth if they'd not paid attention to a false spirit who brought a false word, who wrote a false letter. That's how it happens. Brother Larry, dismiss us tonight, please.